Now, what I have to tell you, and what, I, what I'm going to tell you tonight, I believe that I should. Ezekiel 33 is the watchman chapter. Ezekiel 33, verse 1, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When, not if, but when I bring the sword. When I bring a what? A sword upon a land. If the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman. If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet. The trumpet is the word of God. It's what John heard on the Isle of Patmos. I heard a voice behind me as of a trumpet. He turned around, it was Jesus. So blowing the trumpet means giving out the word of God. Warn them with scriptures. Blow the trumpet and warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet. What are we waiting to hear, by the way? Yeah. Last Amen. And taketh not warning. If the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. I already have blood on my hands from people that I did not warn. And it goes all the way back to high school. Things I could have said to somebody and I didn't. And that's a horrible feeling to know somebody's in hell. You could have said something and you didn't do it. You didn't even try. I didn't even try. So what I'm going to share with you tonight, I feel like I have to because of what I believe. Now, if I'm going to, I'm going to be a lawyer tonight, you're the jury. I'm going to lay my case out to you tonight for why I believe what I believe. If you decide, it, you're going to agree with the scriptures no matter what, because I know you. You know the Bible, you know it's right, and you, I know you're going to agree with what the Bible says. Now, what I give you as to why I think it's saying this, you may or may not agree with me. You don't have to. You don't have to. Remember what I said last night. We're still bound together by the gospel whether or not we agree on, on touching every little thing. Amen? Okay? And I know that this subject is out there, and people either don't want to believe in it, never looked into it, uh, maybe are afraid to say that they believe in it because of the times that we have been in. Okay? But this has been a subject that with me, when I went to the library at school, I was getting the books on Bigfoot, which is real. We had, a, we had Momo up in Missouri, the Missouri monster. Scared me. I thought he was going to reach his arm in my window and grab me any night. Scared that and Charles Manson scared me to death. But anyway, Bigfoot, Loch Ness monster, any unexplained mystery, and UFOs. And that's what, that's what I wanted to know. I wanted to know. Not just believe, but I want to know. And if I, I've come to the point in my life, if I'm going to know something, I'm going to know it the way God said it, or I don't know it. Okay, is that fair enough? So now, let's look at who the gods are, according to Scripture. Who the gods are and why it matters. Why it matters Ezekiel 33 is part of that. And I want you to remember what I just said. Ezekiel 33. I want you to remember that number. I want you to remember that. That's important. Um, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. If you want to turn there very quickly. Verse 4. One generation passeth away. Another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth. And the sun goeth down. And hasteth to his place where he rose. That's how we know the earth's not flat. Has a... Coming up and a going down sun. The wind goes toward the south and turns about under the north. It whirls about continually. And that also is another reason why the earth is not flat. It whirleth about continually south to north. And the wind returneth again according to his circuits. Verse 7. All the rivers run under the sea, yet the sea is not full. Under the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Now why are we reading this? Look at verse 9. The thing that hath been is that which shall be. 
and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. So the thing that hath been of old time, Paul said it like this, these things are written to you for in samples, and to whom the ends of the world are come. So these things in the Bible here are written for us because they are prophetic pictures that God is going to fulfill in the eyes of a generation of people. And maybe, just maybe, we are that generation. Just maybe we are. So it behooves us then to know what this Bible says, to study these stories and to learn these things so that we are, so the wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of our times. So let's look at who the gods are that we're in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 17, verse 2. If there be found among you within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman, that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God in transgressing his covenant, and hath gone and served other what? Gods. Not another God. Other gods. Plural. And worship them either the sun or the moon or what? Any of the host of heaven. The stars. Right? Which I have not commanded. And it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true. And the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel. Then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which had committed that wicked thing under thy gates, even that man or that woman, and thou shalt stone them with stones till they die. Now, the, the judgment of stoning with stones was itself a prophetic type of how the fourth kingdom is destroyed. How is the fourth kingdom destroyed? A stone cut without hands crashes on the ten toes. That hurts. Amen? And think of ten. What is it that's ten in the Bible? Right, the law. Okay, so the law cannot save us. The, um, the judgment of the law is why those ten kings come to this earth. Okay, what am I trying to say? There's a, there's a neat thing here. But anyway, what is it? First Corinthians, I've just gone blank. 1 Corinthians 15, death is swallowed up in victory. I better read this. Hang on. You ever had that happen before, Jamie? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, here it is. Verse 56. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is what? So what's the strength? What's holding up this golden, silver, bronze, iron image? The ten toes, the strength of the man of sin is the law. So when Christ, who is the stone cut without hands, crashes down on the ten toes, the whole thing comes down and dissolves into dust. Isn't that neat? So the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, amen, for Christ. Anyway, that's what I was trying to say. So that's what the judgment of stoning with stones was all about. It was a prophetic picture of Christ, the stone, coming in the last days and destroying the Antichrist kingdom. That's what I meant to say. Deuteronomy 13. I think I either have God fighting against me or devils, one of the two. And if God's fighting against me, I'll go sit down. Let somebody else preach. Deuteronomy 13, 13. Certain men, the children of Belial, who are they? Who are they? Children of Belial. The wheat and the tares. In Matthew 13. He said, I better read it. Because my mind is leaving me. Turn to Matthew 13. Look at verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are who? Children of the kingdom. Who's that? That's us. Who are the tares? Children of the wicked one. That's everybody else. 
You can be born again of incorruptible seed or corruptible seed. 1 Peter 1, 23. Which is it? Which one are you born again of? Corruptible or incorruptible? And corruptible seed always produces corruptible fruit. But it never produces incorrupt fruit. Amen? So, children of Belial, I take it literally. I think the Bible's telling us something. Are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve who? Other gods which ye have not known. Hidden ones. They're hidden. Then shalt thou inquire, make search, and ask diligently, and behold, if it be truth, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly, and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. So he said, watch out for the ones who say, let us go serve other gods, plural. Many of them. Deuteronomy 32. This is the Bible telling you what these gods are. It's identifying them. Who in here has ever heard the idea that demons are the disembodied spirits or souls of the giants that were killed in Noah's flood? Who has, had, who has heard of that? Anybody? Y'all are clean. Because I've encountered that in the years that I've been doing this. People say, oh, I know who devils are. Devils are the disembodied spirits or the souls of the giants that were killed in the flood. And I went, oh. And then I went, where is that? In the Bible. They said, well, it's in the book of Enoch. <laughs> that ain't the Bible. So that ain't true, is it? So he's telling you here, they sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not. To what kind of gods? New gods that came newly up. What did the witch of Endor see? New gods coming up out of the earth, didn't she? That came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. So we know now who these gods are. They are devils. So every time you see a devil in the Bible, you know that he is a he or whatever it is, is one of the gods that the Old Testament told to stay away from and stay away from anybody who worships them, right? Judges chapter 2. Turn there. <coughs> Judges chapter 2. Appreciate you praying for me if you are. That was a hint. Judges chapter 2, verse 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear. And who is that angel of the Lord? He's the one that swear unto your fathers. It's Jesus. Amen. Because look at what he's saying. I swear it unto your fathers. That was Jesus. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. Remember what Paul said about his thorn? What it was? What was it? A messenger of Satan, a devil, a god that was dispatched right to Paul to buffet him daily. It was a devil, an evil angel. The Bible calls them evil angels, devils, gods, familiar spirits, beasts. It calls them all of these things. So God said their gods shall be a snare unto you. That means they're laying a trap and they'll be thorns. And Hebrews 6 says, that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and nigh unto cursing. Amen? So, think about this. Turn to Psalm 82. Here we have the fall of the gods. Are they going to fall? Yeah. Psalm 82, verse 6. I have said, ye are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. 
If you want to make a note in your Bible, underline that phrase, your gods, all of your children, most high, and write Genesis 6 next to it. Because the sons of God were these gods. Because the gods are the children of the most high. They were created by God, weren't they? Okay, I've said you're gods and all of you are children of the most high, but ye shall die like who? Men. See, the thing about a god is it's immortal. They don't die. That's, that's what separates them. Remember I was teaching about the fourth dimension? I was doing that on purpose. They're separate from us. We die, they don't, unless they do something that apparently trips God's trigger and he causes them to fall. You shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. The word prince is a spirit word. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. So you have the prince of Tyrus. You have the prince of the people of Persia in the book of Daniel. The prince of Israel, which is Michael. But then you have the prince of peace, which is Jesus. So these princes are spirits, devils gods and some of them apparently are going to die like men when they fall they actually made a movie about it called city of angels it's with nicholas cage and he was an angel who was in love with meg ryan and he wants to marry her he wants to feel love. So he finds a guy that used to be an angel, whose name was John Messenger, and he said, you got to fall. That's how you do it. You got to fall. And that's what he did in this movie. He was on a high platform and he fell, and boom, and now all of a sudden he's got blood on his head. He's never had that before. The whole thing, Genesis 6 and what you see here, was played out in a movie script. See, we have the Bible. The devil doesn't. He uses... Hollyweird and music. Amen? And comic books and everything else. Now look at Revelation 6, 12. Now beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Remember, stars are angels. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. What did they hear on the day of Pentecost? Rushing mighty wind. Okay, so there's a connection there. But the sixth seal, the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. So we have, we have the description of it in Revelation 12. So there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. We know who that is, because he says it. Having seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part. What did we say that was as a percentage? But it's not just 33, is it? It's 33 point what? How far? Do you know why? The angels are innumerable. Because there is an innumerable company of angels. So I want you to think about how neat God is, how smart he is. God can take an endless number and cut off one third of it. I bet you can't do that. Amen. That's why it goes 33.33333333 and there is no end of it. And yet God knows where the end of all the numbers are because he's higher than they are. He's the most high. Amen. <laughs> you tried being that. You tried being higher than the highest number because we know there isn't one. It never ends. And yet God's above that. And we're, we're not, amen? So it's tailed you. Do you know the Hindus worship many gods? Do you know how many? Lots. 33 million. Who do they worship? Third part of the stars. Da, da, da. Now look at verse 7. There was a war in heaven. 
There was a war in the earthly promised land, right? That's a picture. It's a foreshadow. And there's a war in heaven, the heavenly promised land. Michael and his angels would be Joshua and his army. Joshua is Jesus, or Michael. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels. So now they, the Bible's identifying these stars. They're angels. And prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So we, not, we have him identified, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So they're coming. They're going to fall. Revelation 6. They haven't fallen yet. But God's going to kick them out when he opens the sixth seal. So here's the question. What do they look like? How will we know them? I mean, we know that we can entertain an angel, not know we entertain an angel, right? So, and we know that the ones that accompanied the Lord talking with Abraham were men. They look like men. They got their feet washed. They ate beef. And then they left and went to Sodom and had their feet washed again and ate some more in Lot's house. And the men of Sodom wanted, right? So they looked like, okay, some of them. But we know from Ezekiel 1, in fact, let's turn to Ezekiel 1, and we'll kind of hold our place there for a while. We know from Ezekiel 1 that some of them don't look like men. Some of them have a different appearance. They were called in Ezekiel 1. You see, you see, this is neat. Remember the two eyes I told you you had? And they don't quite see the exact same thing? You have two testaments. And Ezekiel's looking from one direction at these angels, and John's looking at it from another direction, at the same image. Ezekiel calls them living creatures. John calls them beasts. Ezekiel says it was, uh, what does Ezekiel say here? One of them look like. An, uh, an ox, but John said it was a calf. I don't see it's a discrepancy in the Bible. I see two eyes looking at the same thing, but seeing it slightly different, the one from the other. Okay? So, we know that they have different appearances. Some of them can even, I believe, change their appearance. The witch at Endor brought up a what? A familiar spirit. But this particular familiar spirit made himself appear as Samuel. You see, there's a picture there for you. There's a prophecy in that. Because there is another Jesus coming. What is he going to look like? Probably every picture that everybody's drawn and every statue that everybody's made, because we don't know what he, but we'll know him. Amen? Amen. Okay, so what do they look like? Well, the Sumerians had them looking like this. These are called the Igigi. Okay? And that means something about their eyes. There was something about their eyes that just really stood out. So here is a Sumerian tablet with these three gods and their chariot. This is, you ever heard of the Nazca lines? In Nazca Desert in Peru, a guy discovered this in the 40s because he had an airplane that flew over it for the first time. Nobody had ever seen it from 10,000 feet. And he's looking down and he sees all these characters in the dirt just kind of carved out into the dust. And it never rains there. So they've been preserved for thousands of years. And they're huge. If you're on the ground, you would never know what it was. You have to be 10,000 feet in the air to see them. And they're all drawn out nearly perfectly. There's a bird, there's a spider, there's a monkey drawn out there, and they're huge. And then there's this thing, a god, waving. 
And that's on the side of a mountain. And what they did is look like they took like some kind of shovel or a pickaxe and just drew out about a meter wide in, into the, the rocky ground and just carved it out. It ain't but half an inch deep, but it's remained that way for thousands of years. But somebody drew that and you can only know what it is from about 10,000 feet up in the air. And that's thousands of years old. We don't know how old it is. And it looks like this, doesn't it? Yeah, I heard you say it. Steven Spielberg. Okay, before he made E.T. the extraterrestrial, which was a mockery of Christ, because here this God comes down to the earth, and he dies, and then he's resurrected, and then he ascends back up into the heavens. Do you get it? Before he made this movie, he made Close Encounters of the Third Kind. First movie my mom ever let me go see at the theater when I was a boy. I was just fascinated because there was flying saucers everywhere. And guess what he did? He used the story of Moses taking the children of Israel to Mount Sinai to meet God. He used that as the basis for Close Encounters. Because in Close Encounters, the aliens come and they pick 12 people. And 12 people, and they put this thing in their head of this mountain to go to, and they all show up at this mountain, and it's not the mountain of God, it's Devil's Tower. Because these 12 people are supposed to go with the aliens in their mothership, not God the Father, the mothership. Okay, and there's more to it, I'm not going to get it. They even have a scene in the movie where the movie, The Ten Commandments, is playing on a TV set. And I, I'm going, there it is right there. The whole story of the 12 tribes going to meet God at Mount Sinai was in that movie. Here's what some of these gods... Did, did anybody see these? I think so. We know from the scriptures that there were times in the book of Job, one of Job's friends saw a spirit, didn't he? He saw it. He said the hair stood up on the back of his neck. Okay? So they carved out these gods with, and usually they're very angry faces. They look mean, don't they? Don't approach this animal if you see it. Here's the Igigi again. This is, um, I think, Uhura Mazda, one of the gods. He looks like a man, but he's got wings. Here's some more. Here, here. What is it that just stands out with them? The eyes. The eyes just sort of... And that here, this guy here, what does he look like to you? Yeah, there you go. I'll accept that. Chuck Sheet. Chuck Sheet. <laughs> she this lady here said that. I didn't say that. I would have said it, Chuck. Who said Sleestack? In the land of the lost. And they were reptilians, weren't they? Dragons. Are there dragons? Are there spirits that look like serpents and dragons? Absolutely. Look at these. Here, here, here. Yep. You're right. You're exactly right. Yeah. These are the dogu, the Japanese. What's the first thing you notice? The eyes. Here's another version of it, like a female version of it. These all look like the representation of aliens that you have, the big heads and the big eyes. Nah, you... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All the ancient representations, I won't say all of the ancient representations but hundreds of them 
It's like they took pictures of their gods, but they're not photographs. They're just cave paintings and sculptures, masks that they made to represent their gods. This is uh, somewhere in the Middle East. They dug these creatures up. Notice the heads. Uh, Saturday Night Live had a skit. They ran for years, the cone heads. Where did they get the idea from? They just make it up? Remember, the prince of the power of the air is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Steven Spielberg was led to write these scripts the way, he let, the way he wrote them, by a spirit. And these creatures here, notice the eyes, but these are female ones. And this one's holding, this is Madonna and child. There, it's the fertility god, Isis or Ashtaroth, out of the Bible. And she had a baby named Temuz who died and needs to be resurrected. Notice the image here. The large heads, the reptilian look, looking features. Here's some more here. The eyes, the shape of the head. Uh, this is uh, an ancient, I won't even try to pronounce that. It's an ancient culture in China. So the Chinese representation naturally they had probably never seen a Caucasian person in their eyes, so they, you can see the slant there to their eye, but it's the eyes. And is this a happy face, a smiley face, a nice friendly face, like we're here to bless you, or what kind of face is that? Yeah. Yeah, have you for dinner. Turn to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. I probably had this in my notes, but I'm jumping ahead here. So look at verse 49. This is the curse for not keeping the Ten Commandments. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far. How far? Where is the end of the earth? Yeah, there's actually a line... I forgot what it's called, but there's a line where the atmosphere ends and space begins. Neil Armstrong, this true story, Neil Armstrong was a test pilot and he had, was flying this experimental plane that had different jet engines on it, different jets on it, different places, and he actually went up above the atmosphere in this plane. And he's got to try to bring it back down, and he brings it back down, and he actually bounces the plane off the atmosphere. Now, his rudder and his ailerons don't work because there's no air, and he's going, you know, 100,000 miles an hour or something like that. But he's really booking it, so what he does, he thinks quickly. That's why he's the first guy landing on the moon, because the way he thought. And he actually used the, the jet nozzles on the wings to tilt that plane to literally slice his way into the atmosphere so he could take control of the plane again. It's a true story. The tail number on that plane was 666. You go look it up. I didn't make that up. Okay? Yeah. Look at these guys. Oh, I didn't, I didn't finish reading verse 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Is that in churches? Are there churches where they speak languages that nobody understands? Is that a blessing or is that a good thing or what? And no, notice verse 50, a nation of what? Fierce countenance. Like an alligator. Alligators are not inviting creatures. Alligators don't, you don't look at them and say, oh, the pretty alligator, can I pet you? Now, a dolphin has a smile on it, doesn't it? And you can pet dolphins. They will not eat you. Alligators will eat you. And probably so will these. So this was their gods. 
So notice the serpent here. Big heads, big eyes. And they came in chariots. They came to earth in chariots. This is an ancient from the, the Vedic literature the, of Hindus. The gods, these gods are actually having a war. They came in chariots. Here, 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 here. Is that even possible? And see, that's the question you have to ask. Is it even biblically possible? So, I mean, I, I've known some of this stuff for years, but I wouldn't talk about it. I wouldn't talk about it online. I wouldn't teach on it in the ministry. I wouldn't say anything about it. Because I had to know from the Bible whether or not this thing is even worth looking into or not. I have to know from scriptures if I can say this. So according to the ancient depictions, some of them came in chariots. Does the Bible say something similar to that or the same thing? Here, here's one of their chariots here. Do you see these big heads here? Here. Apollo, the sun god, rode in a chariot. You have the gods here in the chariots, a contest of the dragon chariot and the dragon riders is what this says here, aerial contest of the dragon riders. Here's one, the, another depiction of the sun god being drawn through the sky by serpents. Are there flying serpents in the Bible? Fiery flying serpents, which tells you that they are spirits. They are the angelic realm. They are the gods. The Hindu god Surya rode in a chariot. Four wheels. Very similar, very similar to what we see in Ezekiel 1. In Ezekiel 1, we see God, a whirlwind first, coming out of the north. Then we see the four living creatures... And then we see that the four living creatures, um, in verse 15, I was I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. So each one of the living creatures had a wheel, and it was described as a wheel within a wheel. That's in verse 16. Was, their work was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And, and I have this on, I got this in my notes too. When Solomon depicted this in the temple, when he built the temple, and he built the platform for the Ark of the Covenant, which was the throne of God, he put the glass there, four bulls, and he put chariot wheels underneath it. Read your Bible. That, it's there. He put chariot wheels because apparently God rides a chariot. Our God... Now, don't ask me why, but he does. He rides a chariot. And this chariot is alive because he calls them the living creatures. This chariot is actually alive, even the wheels, because the Bible says the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels, making it alive. These are the Vimanas from Hindu texts, from the Vedas, the ancient Sanskrit texts. They depicted chariots of the gods flying through the heavens, able to go anywhere at almost any speed. Now go back to Ezekiel 1. Look at verse 13. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of lamps. When people see UFOs, what, how do they, what do they see? Lights. And some, you know... I've listened to a lot of people talk about them. I've read a lot of books. And one guy asked the question, why are these UFOs showing up with lights? And he said, they want to be seen. 
They don't have to appear. They, they are not naturally visible to us, but they're showing up and they're appearing and they've got lots of lights. Why? He said, I think they want to be seen. And this guy that said that wants these things to come down here and show us their chariots, show us their technology, show us how we can become gods like they are. Not making this stuff up. So the Vimanas from the ancient Sanskrit text were the gods riding in various chariots, flying through the air, having wars. Here's depictions here, here, here. This is a place in India. It's one of the oldest cave paintings. Here's the chariot. And here's the gods that were in them. What do they look like? What do they look like? The Bible word is devils. Just to help you out here, I don't believe in little green men that live on Mars. Okay? Like on Bugs Bunny. Or Star Trek. I don't believe these other planets, that's, that's where they live and that's where they come from. I don't believe that. I believe they're devils. Does that, does that help you out? Does that make you feel better about what I'm saying? The term paleo contact means that we're not the only generation of people that's seen these things. They were depicted in various art pieces here. In this painting, this is actually a religious painting. This is some sort of saint, Catholic church, being blessed by God somehow. But notice, notice where the blessing's coming from. This one here depicted on an ancient coin. This was a photograph taken probably 60 years ago, 70 years ago, something like that. And it looks a lot like this. This is a Japanese illustration. Several mm, thousand years ago, maybe. Japanese villages, a Japanese village noticed this thing coming up out of the sea this woman looking person came out holding a rectangle box she spoke a language that they had no idea what it was and it had these symbols on it that nobody's ever been able to decipher what those symbols are a language that thou shalt not understand she matches what's in the bible and she would go back in this little thing and go to another village and do the same thing. She made several appearances. Several people, several villages saw her. Here you have some of the Vimanas again. Notice, notice this one's got a gun. Okay. Here, chariots. This painting here. This painting here, but I think it's the Virgin Mary, but notice... Whoever painted this is the guy right here. Look what he's doing. He's looking, he's seeing that object, and he decided to put that in his painting for some reason. Again, the, the gods coming in chariots. Elijah. Elijah. What came down and separated Elijah from Elisha? A chariot of fire and horses of fire, meaning... They were angels. Even the chariot. Even the chariot. Because that's what you see in Ezekiel 1. The ch I have a verse to show you. Psalm 68. Turn there and underline this verse in your Bible and take a look at it. Tell me, tell me what you read. Look at that on the screen. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. So what is your Bible telling you? That God has, number one, he don't have just one of these. He's got 20,000 of them. 
chariots that are angels. That's what the verse says. The chariots of God are 20,000 angels. 20,000, even thousands of angels. So they're alive. Which is... Hang on a second. It's not as far-fetched as you might think. I got in a, we rented a car last year going to Fargo because our plane couldn't leave because they were expecting a blizzard. So we rented a car, and I'm driving a car, and all of a sudden the wheel starts turning. And what in the world? And it did it again. And I'm going, Lisa, this wheel's turning on its own. And I realize that as I approach the lines, the car put me back where I belong. Now I'm going, I hate this. If I want to drive on that line, I'll drive on that line. It's my car. We're make, my insurance agent told me. He said, we had a meeting of sheltered insurance agents. And he said, they brought up the idea, not if, but when the smart cars showed up and they were self-driving vehicles, when they crash, who's liable? Can't be the driver. He wasn't driving. So who, who's going to pay the damages? Is it the car company, the software company, the computer company that made the computer? Who's going to pay for that? I mean, it's a real question that we've never had to ask before. But now we have it because we have cars now that they're calling smart cars, and they're getting smarter every time. And at some point, they will be autonomous. Turn to Revelation 13. You have it in front of you. You have the picture. You have everything in your hand of what I'm telling you. It's all right here. Look at Revelation 13, verse 13. He doeth, make, he doeth great wonders, so he maketh fire come down from heaven and the other than the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that sh they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So they make an image to the beast. That's been done before. Every religion has little God statues, right? But this one's different. In verse 15, he, the false prophet, had power to do what? Give life to a statue. So I'm not crazy, am I? If I say that the, the chariots that God rode in were alive, you can believe it. You can believe it. Amen. Amen? See, this Bible is smarter than all of us. All right, we've, I've covered Ezekiel. We've read that. I think I've covered what I wanted to cover about that. The wheel in the middle of a wheel. They had rings. Rings were full of eyes round about. Whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their Spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the Spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. The wheels were alive, just like this image of the beast is alive. And he's so alive, he causes, he has a will, he has a desire. He causes everybody that doesn't worship him to have their head cut off. Never been seen in history before, but it's going to happen. Uh, let's see here. In Solomon's temple, this is what I was telling you all ago. When he made the platform for the Ark of the Covenant, the work of the wheels was like the work of a chariot wheel. And there, no, let's, let's count these. Axle trees, knaves, fellows, and spokes. How many? What did I tell you last night? What that number represented, the spiritual realm. And in the spiritual realm, the wheels aren't just dead sitting there. They're alive. 2 Kings 2, verse 11, It came to pass as they still went on that, and talked. Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire. The, they were alive. 2 Kings 6, oh, I love this story. Verse 13, he said, Go and spy where he is, that am I send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore, send he hither horses and chariots and a great host. 
This is the enemy of God's people. Pay attention to the story. This is the enemy of God's people, and this is a prophecy. And what does the enemy of God's people come in? Chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, they that be with us are more than they be with them. Do the math. One third is less than... There are more with us than with them. Amen? And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. He saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. Dun, 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 dun. Some of you will get that. And what were they? What were they? Angels, the host of God. Because there was a war here, wasn't there? And there was an attack on God's people, and they sent them in chariots. Pharaoh. How did Pharaoh go after the Israelites? 600 of them. That number is important. Sisera, when he came to attack the Israelites, he came with 900 chariots of iron. What kingdom mingles themselves with the seed of men? The iron kingdom, the fourth one. It's all right here, folks. Isaiah 66, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his, his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Behold, Jeremiah 4, 13, he shall come up as clouds and his chariots shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. And remember, one of the angels had the face of an eagle. Zechariah 6, and I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains. The mountains were the mountains of brass and the first chariot were red horses and the second chariot black horses. The third chariot, white horses. And in the fourth chariot, how many chariots? Grizzled and bay. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said, These are what? Are you buying it now? Are you catching it? They're spirits. And there's good ones. These are good ones. There's bad ones. Evil ones. Deuteronomy 20, our enemies have chariots. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. I think God's telling us something. Joshua 11, and the Canaanite on the east and on the west and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and on the Jebusite in the mountains and to the Hivite under, the, under Hermon in the land of Mizpah. And they went out, they and all their host with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude with horses and very many. And when all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Miram to fight against Israel. When the devil sends his army, he's sending them with chariots. 1 Kings 20, verse 1. Turn there. I'll give you eight seconds. That's how long it takes to ride a bull. 1 Kings 20, verse 1. Ben-Hadad, you mark this verse. The king of Syria gathered all his host. Host is an angel word. Host is an army word. And there were 30 and two kings with him. So how many kings altogether? 33. Isn't that interesting? You see this symbol? What's he got in his claws? Sword. What did I tell you? Ezekiel 33. When the sword cometh. When the sword cometh. And this whole image represents the hybrid kingdom of Daniel chapter 2. The iron mixed with miry clay. Because they're pointing in opposite directions, aren't they? It represents the past and the future, left and right, yes and no, black and white, evil and good, on, off. It represents opposites fused together like iron and clay. And the crown, of course, that's a king. Ben-Hadad and his 32 kings. By the way, this is where we get that song, He's the God on the mountain. That song, you ever heard that song? It comes from this chapter. Because, get this. The 33 kings 
attack Israel on a hill and they get beat. Who was 33? And what did he do on a hill? He defeated them. So the kings, the 33 kings went back and got drunk. And they, you read this chapter, and said, well, their gods are the gods of the mountain, but I bet they're not the gods of the valley. So they went after them again. And what happened? They got beat. The valley is Armageddon. Wow. <laughs> Amen. The 33. 2 Kings 23, 11, he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the sun and at the entering in of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain which was in the suburbs and burned the chariots of the sun. I've always wanted to know what that meant. Remember I showed you the sun God always came across the sky in a chariot? Isaiah 31, 1, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because there are many. Woe to them that trust in chariots. Now get ready for what I'm going to show you. I, I got more verses. And they shall come against thee with chariots, wagons, and wheels, and with an assembly of people which sit against thee the buckler and shield and helmet round about. Daniel eleven forty. 40, And at the time the end shall the king of the south push at him. The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen. And many ships. Dun, dun, dun. Joel 2, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. The shield of his mighty men is made ready. I didn't, I didn't read Ezekiel 1 that showed you how this chariot moved. In verse 13, it says the fire was bright. Uh, that's not it. Oh, verse 14, the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Which means they went from here to there and back again as fast as lightning. They traveled without acceleration and deceleration. We can't do that here. That breaks the laws of physics. In order for us to go to a speed, 60 miles an hour, we have to accelerate to that. And to stop, we have to decelerate to that. If not, it'll kill us. They don't have to accelerate or decelerate. They just go and come back. This is Kenneth Arnold. 1947, he was flying a, a plane around Mount Rainier. And what had happened, he was a, a salesman and was, was a pilot also. So he's flying a plane. He's flying a plane around Mount Rainier because he had heard that a plane had gone down mysteriously around Mount Rainier somewhere and he was looking for it and as he was looking he sees nine of these craft flying at a very high rate of speed he was able to judge the speed I can't remember how fast it was so he described what he saw and he said their motion was like saucers skipping across the water so the newspapers picked up the phrase flying saucers. That's where it came, came from Kenneth Arnold and what he saw in 1947. Go back in history. Josephus. You ever heard of Josephus? The Jewish historian. Here's what he wrote. A.D. 65. For before sunset throughout all parts of the country, chariots were seen in the air and armed battalions hurtling through the clouds and encompassing, encompassing cities. And that's similar to what Elijah or Elisha saw. Chariots in the sky. Josephus wrote about it. In Nuremberg, Germany, 1561, the residents of Nuremberg witnessed what seemed to be an aerial battle over their city. They described objects shaped like orbs, crosses, cylinders, and black arrow-like vessels. After some time, they heard what seemed to be a major crash outside of the city. And this is the account, and this is an illustration of what they saw back in 15... So we're not the first generation to ever encounter this. Hamburg, Germany, 1697, described two glowing wheels flying through the sky. During the late 1800s, people were seeing airships all over the United States. Newspapers were reporting on them. 
You can find these in archives. February 25th, 1942. This is called the Battle of Los Angeles. Because we had been attacked at Pearl Harbor, the people of Los Angeles and the military thought the Japs had made it to Los Angeles. And there were these flying, glowing objects in the sky moving at a fast rate of speed, and the military started firing at these flying objects, literally trying to fight them to fend off, because they thought it, was, it might be the Japanese, that they had something that we didn't know about. True story. Then, Roswell Daily Record, our, the Roswell Army Air Force captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. This happened. I know it did. Because I know what the scripture says. The military actually released the story. They said, let the press know we recovered a flying saucer. And then, a day later, they said, no, we didn't. No, we didn't. Don't worry, everybody calm down, don't worry. You see, the Pentagon remembered the War of the Worlds. You know what I'm talking about? The 1930s, they broadcast H.G. Wells' story, The War of the Worlds, about the Martians landing, and people went nuts all over New Jersey because they thought this was a real event because they presented it like a news flash. And so people in the government said, we can't let people know about flying saucers because this already happened and they'll go nuts. So it's been kept secret. This is one of the first photographs. McMinnville, Oregon, May 11th, 1950. A farmer sees this thing flying, goes in, gets his camera, takes two snapshots. And 60 years later, these photographs have withstood every test. They were not faked. There was no Photoshop in 19-whatever. Okay? Something was flying in the air. A saucer-shaped wheel. 1951, you had the Lubbock Lights. This was Life Magazine did a whole article on this. People kept seeing these lights off in the distance outside of Lubbock, Texas. Salem, Massachusetts, Coast Guard photographer took this picture July 16th, 1952. Sicily, Italy, December 10th, 1954. This guy's running with his camera to take a photograph of whatever that was. Notice that they're kind of here and kind of not in this picture. That's what some of you think of me, probably. <laughs> March 13th, 1997, Phoenix, Arizona. Over 10,000 people saw the Phoenix Lights. Several people videotaped it, photographed it. The governor of Arizona saw it. He called the Air Force Base nearby and said, what are you guys flying out there? We're not flying anything. We don't have anything going is what they said. So then when the story broke about these lights appearing in the, in the sky, and this is massive. This thing here is huge. Just staying there, hovering over the city of Phoenix. Then the Army or the Air Force comes out with a story saying, oh, we, were dropping we forgot we were dropping flares that night. We forgot. But this is what some people, there's two different events on the same night, and that's what most people saw. This happened in Zimbabwe in the 1990s. This convinces me. If your daughter came running in and said, Mom, I saw a flying saucer land out in our yard, and three aliens came out. Would you believe her? Maybe, maybe not, Right? How old is she? How old are you? Eight. So at the Ariel Elementary School in Zimbabwe, 62 10 to 12 year old children saw a craft land. They all drew pictures 
of nearly identical aliens coming out. Some of these kids, they said when they looked at their eyes, they got stuff put into their brains, images of like the end of the world kind of stuff. Like everything's on fire and we're destroying the planet, man's evil and all this kind of stuff. This is 12 year old girls and boys. This guy here is Dr. John Mack. He is a Harvard psychiatrist. He went out to interview these children. And he said, they're not lying. 62 children out of 100 children at this school all saw the exact same thing, and they told me the exact same story. He said, this is not a hallucination. This is not a schoolyard prank. And he said, if this is real, this has to change my perception of this universe. Okay? 62 kids are not lying. 20 years later, there's a documentary coming out called Aerial Phenomenon. 20 years later, a film crew went out and interviewed these students. And they're all standing by their story. We know what we saw. We know what we saw. Let me play this for you. Um, see this dot right here? This is from the International Space Station. Watch that dot. Okay? It's going to take a few seconds for the, the video is actually moving. A guy's explaining this. And you'll see his mouse come across the screen. But this came out recently from the International Space Station. Watch that object. We don't know what that is. We don't have anything like that. Then it just... Boom. It's going to take off. And it's gone. List of people who believe in UFOs. General Douglas MacArthur. General George Marshall, General Walter Smith, Werner Von Braun, Albert Einstein, President Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan delivered a speech to the United Nations and said, what if an alien race invaded our planet? Would it not bring us all together? President Jimmy Carter actually filed a report. He saw a glowing object from a plane that he was in. President Richard Nixon, President Dwight Eisenhower, President John Kennedy, President Bill Clinton, John Podesta, who was Bill Clinton's uh, Chief of Staff, Hillary Clinton's advisor. In fact, both Bill and Hillary went on the talk shows during the 2016 election and said, if Hillary gets in, we will get to the bottom of this. We'll release the records. Uh, Colonel, there's actually, in the WikiLeaks email that was leaked from Hillary's email, John Podesta was in contact with several people on the UFO issue saying, if we win the White House, we're going to pull these records out and show everybody. Colonel Philip Corso, I'll tell you who he is in a minute. Walter Cronkite, Gordon Cooper, Deke Slayton, Edgar Mitchell, Charles de Gaulle, Mick Jagger, Katy Perry. These people don't matter to me. But anyway, Jeff Goldblum, Will Smith, Steven Spielberg, Halle Berry, Russell Crowe, David Bowie, William Shatner. Of course he believes in him. He was the flu one. Keanu Reeves, Muhammad Ali, Gillian Anderson, Dwayne Johnson, Sigourney Wiener, Dan Aykroyd, Olivia Newton-John, Stephen Hawking, Fran Drescher, Sammy Hagar, Gordon Cooper, astronaut sightings, Gordon Cooper, Deke Slayton, Robert White, Ed White, James McDivitt, Jim Lovell, Scott Borman, Scott Carpenter, all saw objects. Mercury 7 astronauts, Gemini astronauts, Apollo astronauts. Ed, ast astronaut Edgar Mitchell, six man to land on the moon. Here's what he said. There have been craft that have been recovered. This is, this is, a, I mean, this is a, a guy, a known guy, who publicly, on camera, says this. There has been a certain amount of reverse engineering that has allowed some of these craft or some components to be duplicated, and there are those who are utilizing some of this equipment in certain ways, and perhaps a large part of the activity that's classified as UFO activity may very well not be due to ET activity at all. If there are ETs at all, he said, I do not see anything that suggests really malevolent intent or hostile intent. Boy, is he wrong. He said, 
there is smoking gun evidence that has not or cannot be brought forward at this point. That's what he said. And Edgar Mitchell, a trained scientist, which is why he got to go to the moon. He's one of the first scientists that got to ride he, uh, Apollo 14, maybe. Six men to walk on the moon. On the way back, he has like this ecstatic experience that's described in Hindu religion. And now he believes that everything in the universe is one. We're all one thing. And he believes that these aliens out here mean us no harm. He had this experience on the way back to earth. Something changed him and his point of view on his way back to the earth. Gordon Cooper, one of the Gemini or Mercury 7 astronauts, he said, I believe these ET vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets, which obviously are a little more technically advanced than we are here on earth. And this is not Billy and Bubba out drinking one night, coon hunting, and said that they saw an alien. These are guys with reputations that are willing to come out and say, this is what we know. Gordon Cooper was also a test pilot with top secret clearance. He was at an air base with a film crew filming landings of, you know, test craft as they were landing. And he said... At Edwards Air Force Base, I was having some of the cameramen film precision landings. A saucer flew right over them, put down three landing gears, and landed out on the dry lake bed. They went out with their camera towards the UFO. It lifted off and flew off at a very high rate of speed. I had a chance to hold it, the film, up to the window to look at it. Good close-up shots. There was no doubt in my mind that it was made someplace other than on this earth. In my opinion, they were worried it would panic the public if they knew that someone had vehicles that had this kind of performance, so they started telling lies about it. Then I think they had to cover it up with another lie. Now they don't know how to get out of it. That's what he said he saw on camera. He said this. Captain Robert Salas, while stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, received a call that a bright red UFO was hovering above the launch control facility, above where we have our Minuteman missiles. Shortly after, he personally witnessed the shutdown of all 16 minute man nuclear missiles. And he said, that doesn't happen. We may have one shutdown. And we, so we bring in technicians, get it back going again. But all 16 dropped out, meaning that if they received launch orders, they would not be able to launch those missiles. So they had to have guys come out and reboot all these missiles to get them back going again. Similar incidents have been reported from both American and Soviet Union missile bases. He testified this in front of the press. We have uh, Victor Marchetti, former special assistant, the executive director of the CIA. We have indeed been contacted, perhaps even visited by extraterrestrial beings and U.S. government in collusion with other national powers of the earth is determined to keep this information from the general public. Dr. Hermann Oberth, who was a German rocket scientist working with Werner von Braun, said, we have been helped by people from outer space. He was working with von Braun for Hitler and said the reason why Hitler was able to build all these rockets and all these jets. I mean, Hitler was working on an atomic bomb. He was building jets and he was building rockets. And he was close, very close to beating us with atomic bombs. And their scientists said, we didn't come up with this. This was given to us. The nation, General Douglas MacArthur said, the nations of the world will have to unite. Notice the language. For the next war will be an interplanetary war. The nations of the earth must someday make a common front against attack by people from other planets. Now that part I don't believe. Because I know from the Bible what they are. So this president is building a what? Space force. We have to be in space. That's what he said. Harry Truman said, I can assure you that flying saucers, given that they exist, are not constructed by any power on earth. This is a memo to J. Edgar Hoover, March 22nd, 1950. This was declassified. And what it says is, it says to Director FBI... 
An investigator for the Air Force stated that three so-called flying saucers had been recovered in New Mexico. They were described as being circular in shape with raised centers approximately 50 feet in diameter. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape but only three feet tall dressed in metallic cloth of a very fine texture. Each body was bandaged in a manner similar and so on. Here's another office memorandum to the director FBI giving evidence. This was declassified in 2010. Released, uh, it is well known that there have been during the past two years reports from the various parts of this country of the sighting of unidentified serial op aerial objects which have been called in newspapers flying disc and flying saucers. The first such sightings were reported from Sweden and it was thought that the objects, the nature of which was unknown, might have originated in Russia. Uh, I could go on to read this. Um, let me show you this. Colonel Philip Corso was given by his uh, General Trudeau at the Pentagon. Corso was a World War II guy. He was stationed in Italy. He worked uh, doing counterintelligence there. He comes back to the States, and he's working at Army air bases. And General Trudeau at the Pentagon gave him pieces of the crash disk at Roswell. And he said, Give this to some of the contractors that we work with, see what it does, find out how it works, and let's put it to use for military purposes. So he writes the book the day after Roswell. He saw the material. He worked on it. Project Blue Book was the Air Force's investigation into UFOs, civilian sightings of UFOs. Uh, this guy, J. M., Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who at the onset of Project Blue Book did not believe in UFOs, did not believe in flying saucers, did not believe in aliens. Once he got finished with Project Blue Book, he went giving speeches around the world saying they're real. He investigated them. This is Department of Physics, United States Air Force science textbook for airmen who are going to fly our planes. This came out, this was out in the 60s and the early 70s. Notice chapter 33 of this textbook deals with unidentified flying objects. They trained our pilots on how to spot them, how to engage them. The textbook says, from available information, the UFO phenomenon appears to have been global in nature for almost 50,000 years. I don't believe that part either. But they're saying they're real. And when this book was leaked, they pulled it and they took that chapter out. 2001, National Press Club, Washington, D.C. About 20 men from the Pentagon, various military, CIA, stood up and testified before the press that they had personal first-hand knowledge of military or government encounters with UFOs and they said each one of them said I will testify before Congress that what I'm saying is true it's a felony to lie to Congress you'll go to jail for it then 20 what was it 2014 the Pentagon admitted UFO knowledge the Pentagon created ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. They spent $22 million over five years to study military encounters with UFOs. They released three videos from the front of Air Force jets, 2004, uh, I think 2010, and that's 2010. And 2014 is where these videos come from. This is the um, Go Fast video. You can look this up. The gimbal. And this is the uh, Tic Tac, what they called it. Our guys interfaced with these objects. They said they approached at high rate of speed, stopped, took off at a high rate of speed. They're real. This is Lou Elizondo. He ran a tip for the government for about five years. Let me get to what he said. He said in 2009, he, he quit the program. 2009, specific elements in the Department of Defense resist the effort based on philosophical differences. The fact that the phenomena is real is not denied. 
your government has said, the Air Force came out and said, we do investigate flying saucers. We investigate UFOs. They're real. So, um, I'm going to turn to two more plates. Turn back to Psalm 82. I'm almost done. Psalm 82. Thank you for bearing with me. Now, I said, I believe that a ship crashed at Waswell. But for years, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't trust it. Because if these are angels, angels don't crash. Devils don't die. Because the story was the disc... And they, and they said, you got to realize at Roswell was the only nuclear facility in the world in 1947. The only place in the world that had nuclear weapons was Roswell Air Base. And they had sophisticated radars around Roswell that detected anything approaching Roswell in the Air Force Base. And the thing is that they said that the radars somehow interfaced with the disc and caused them to crash. Three of them. One at Roswell, one at... Um, can't remember the other two places. So I asked God. God, if they're angels, if they're devils, how do they crash? How do they die? Psalm 82. I have said, verse 6, ye are gods and all of you children of the Most High. But... What does it say? You shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. One o'clock in the morning, the Holy Ghost spoke that verse to me and I went, that's it. That's it. God allows them to fall and die. And that's exactly what happened. Now, we know that a third of the angels are falling and they're going to end up here. What we also know is that you have the New Age movement, the wackos, and the UFO movement. There's different types of UFO people. There's the scientific UFO people. There's the wacko UFO people. There's the spiritual UFO people. But they all believe the same thing, that these things are going to make an appearance here. And most of these people want that to happen because they want these gods to come down and give us their stuff so that we don't have any more hunger, we don't have any more wars, nobody ever dies ever again, and we become gods and become like they are up in the sky, just like Satan said in Genesis 3. <coughs> so Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but what are we? Risen and stand upright. Save, Lord. Let the King hear us when we call. So. By the way, Aleister Crowley, the most evil man in the world, was introduced to a spirit called Lamb, and that's what he looked like. So I'm done. I don't have any, I do have more information, but I'm done. Okay? Thank you for hearing me out. If nothing else, you have something to think about tonight. I hope you go to sleep. Okay? Bottom line is, there is an invasion, and it's coming of principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. And they do have more power than us. Humans can't defeat gods except the Lord give them the victory. Amen. Father in heaven, I ask only God that you bless and honor your word that people would be would ask the question like I did, God, is this true? So Father, 
if it causes these people to go to the scriptures and study to find out whether these things are true. That's why I'm here. So Father, I pray to your God that you'd bless them with wisdom, give them wisdom far above anything that I have, and bless and honor your word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said.